going to get started. And uh, we've got about 31 people, Greg, and um, I will introduce Greg Harbour. If you did not get a chance to connect with us last week, I do apologize if there was connection issues. Um, we're working with a new vendor who's sending out text, emails, and the links. And uh, we got to communicate better with them on what to send out when. Um, anyway, Greg Harbour has been in Birmingham since the late 80s, like myself, and has been working at UAB in, my, in the microbiology lab for like 30 plus years. And um, during that time, when he moved to Birmingham, he got interested in birding and has... Uh, in in recent years become an instructor with Alabama Audubon and if you go to Alabama Audubon's website you can see a lot of different classes that you're able to take uh, especially if you're a member I think it is limited to, I, I'm not sure how that is Greg if you want to clarify it for me yeah if some of the classes yeah, are open to everybody yeah, it's, it's open to anybody, but there is a price discount for people who are members, but it's open to anybody. I know that there was recently one on how to stop window collisions. Oh, good, Diane. That was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and um, But uh, there's uh, more in-depth learning as you get more and more into birding. Um, different people do different classes, and Greg often does um, the introductory so uh, that's one place to look for his classes, more of them if you want. And um, he's also a very, very good photographer. Many of his birding photos have appeared, in, uh, especially around Alabama publications. And um, I know he's, he's uh, combined his love of birding and uh, photography um, to our benefit. <laughs> so, um, I want to get started, and as he, he explained to me, last week was the beginner intro how to identify what you should, kind of equipment you might want to have, and what you should feed birds, how to attract them, all that. This month, this week, he's taking us on a tour of Alabama to give us some good places to start seeing the extraordinary um, 400 plus species that we have through our state. Take it over, Greg. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you once again, Shannon. It's good to see everybody. Hopefully, you all can hear me okay. Um, so uh, last week, we did indeed uh, talk a little bit about the basics uh, of birds and bird watching. And in particular, what I hope that you uh, gained from last week was the, the notion of using field marks to help you identify a bird. And so a field mark is simply any kind of physical mark or feature on a bird. It might even be its behavior, it could be a, a bird song, but all of those are what we would call field marks. And those are what allow you to identify different species of birds. And so I showed you last week some of the common birds and we talked a little bit about um, those features that help you identify uh, a particular bird. And so for instance, like cardinals, uh, northern cardinals, the males, as we all know, are bright red. Um, but as we will see, there are other red birds um, in Alabama that are not necessarily cardinals. Um, but what, what gives, you, gives it away that a male cardinal is a male cardinal is in addition to being completely red, it does have a black face mask uh, with a red crest. And so when you see that, you would not likely mistake that for any other bird just because they're so unique looking. So tonight, what I wanted to do was to kind of combine, um, since I'm not a, an Alabama native, I have really over the 30 some odd years that I have lived in the state have really come to appreciate the beauty and the diversity that this state has to offer. And so tonight, what I wanted to do was to give you a virtual tour of the state. We're gonna start at the coast and we're gonna come north through the state. And I'm not gonna 
hit all of the potential birding sites just because there are so, so many. If that is something that you would like to know more about where to go, uh, you can visit the Alabama Birding Trails uh, website. It's just Alabama Birding Trails with an S on the end, dot com. Um, and that website covers the entire state and it has a listing of all the different um, birding sites that are publicly accessible in great places to go birding. And so uh, visit that site. But tonight, I'm just going to give you a little glimpse uh, into the life and the locations to, to see birds in Alabama. So I will share my screen here. And we are going to, so hopefully you all can see this now. Uh, we have a photograph uh, taken here in Birmingham of some chimney swifts going to roost at a chimney that is at the Birmingham Housing Authority uh, District Office that's right there by the Midtown 20 Publix. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit. But what I wanted to do now is to start uh, with an overall view of the state. So here we have the state of Alabama uh, outlined. And so this is from Google Earth or Google Maps. And you can see that it extends all the way from the coast uh, up to the Tennessee Valley area. But in particular, what I really wanted to do was also show you uh, the seafloor. And the reason I might be showing you that, you might think, what on earth, why are we looking at this? So there are certain species of birds that are called pelagic birds, just as a group. And pelagic means open water or deep water. Uh, birds. And so uh, even though I'm not going to show you any photographs of pelagic species just because they're not ones you would typically see, but if you truly wanted to try and see every bird that had ever been documented in Alabama, you would have to actually go offshore. You would still have to remain in Alabama waters, of course, but there are some oil rigs, believe it or not, out off of Alabama that routinely attract um, birds out there. And certainly after hurricanes and such, some of these species do end up in the interior part of the state. But what I really wanted to do was to use this map to show you part of the reason for the diversity of birds and plants and animals and really everything is this, in the state is because we have so many different eco regions within the state and each one of those regions here it's it should there should as far as birding is concerned we have one that's called coastal which would just be uh, mobile and baldwin county but then there's this large area called the gulf coastal plain and we have a piedmont ridge and valley province uh, cumberland plateau and the highland rim and there are different species of birds that can be maybe not exclusively found here, but do tend to confine themselves to certain habitats within this area. And part of that is just because of the plant life um, that is found in some of those. So we're gonna start down here at the coast at Dauphin Island and Fort Morgan. And I wanted to show you some, if you were to go down to the coast, uh, in, in say even now, uh, there would be birds down there at the coast along the sea, uh, at the edge of the sea and on, along the beach, uh, on the shore that you would not typically see in the inland part of Alabama. And so one of these birds is this creature that's called a willet. It's a fairly large sandpiper and it spends pretty much all of its time along the beach running along the waves and, and as you can see here, it uses this long beak to probe into the beach sand for various marine invertebrates um, that it then feeds on. So it could be crabs, it could be marine worms. Here you can see this one is checking out a little snail uh, that has been exposed by the waves. So this is a very fairly common bird. It's not nearly as common though as this little guy. This is a sanderling. And although I do not have a photograph of him chasing the waves, I know that if you have been to the beach, you no doubt have seen this bird because 
This is the bird that chases the waves down the beach, probing as he goes along the way. And then when the waves come back in, he runs back up the beach, just ahead of the wave. And then he follows the wave back out again. And he, if you watch, he is using his bill to probe um, for, again, marine invertebrates. So needless to say, the willet with his much longer bill is able to reach deeper into the beach sand. And so for that reason, um, it, they're able to share the same uh, area as a food resource just because one of them exploits a different, a deeper uh, strata within the beach sand. But the willet and the sanderling are both fairly nondescript birds. And the willet, when he flies though, actually shows a very striking black and white wing pattern. And the sanderling is pretty nondescript as well. And this is true of a lot of birds that spend time on the beach because they use that nondescript plumage to help them uh, camouflage themselves against the beach. So if you are the color of beach sand, um, it certainly helps to uh, protect yourself. And then here is another bird that's about the same size as the sanderling, but it, it, this is a snowy plover. And you'll notice that he has a little bit shorter bill than the sanderling did. And he employs an entirely different feeding strategy. What these guys like to do, they're much more sedate. The plovers in general are much more sedate when it comes to feeding. And so what the plovers like to do is to just walk along and they scurry for a little bit and then they stop. And it's like they just, it's almost like they're sensing and they'll even use their foot to kind of jiggle the sand in front of them to see if they can, um, you know, stir something up. And so they, they run a little bit, a short distance, might be just a foot or two, and then they stop. And then they jiggle the sand. And so this one's standing on some fairly compact sand, but when they're feeding, it's typically right by where the wave action is. And so the sand is loose enough that when they do that little foot jiggle, um, it, it actually moves the sand. They are just, they're so cute and so entertaining to watch. Um, but this is the bird, the sanderling and the plover, the snowy plover are both here only in the winter time. So if you are one of these people who likes the solitude of the beach in winter, the snowy plovers are certainly there, but not in huge numbers. This is a fairly uncommon bird. Uh, it just so happens this one was photographed uh, on Dauphin Island uh, right there by the fishing pier. One bird that is much more common is the ruddy turnstone. And I always thought my sister Trees, who works as a park ranger at, a, at Sebastian Inlet in Florida, had the notion that we should rename these birds rowdy stone turners. And that would probably be a good idea because these guys are just tenacious. They go everywhere. As you can see, this one is standing on a kind of a, a, a moss covered rock. I guess that actually might be some kind of a seaweed and not really moss. But they, you'll see these guys, wherever there's rocks on the jetty, these birds are there and they're just clambering everywhere. And they flip over, they use this very stout beak to flip over tiny stones and shells to get at what might be underneath. And so when you watch these guys, they're just kind of plodding along on their little short legs um, and in just flipping over the stones. And they're so fun to watch. I just, I really love them. They've got those bright orange legs against this white belly and this dark back. Um, they do not breed in Alabama. This too is another bird that's just here in the winter time. And if I could, I would just like to add one conservation note here. You'll notice that on the left, on the bird's left foot, it has, you know, full toes, but the the toes on the right, it looks like they've been amputated. And the reason that is, is because um, these birds quite often will get their feet entangled in fishing line uh, that has been discarded. And so if you are ever at the beach or somewhere, and it's not even at the beach, it could be a, you know, a freshwater lake somewhere. If you see fishing line that can be 
picked up and discarded properly, please do that because I have seen some birds that didn't have any toes, both legs, no toes, and they were just, you know, it's just pitiful to watch. So that's, I'll get off my soapbox about that. But this is the ruddy turnstone. And another bird that you might see at the beach, uh, again, just kind of probing as this one is, is a spotted sandpiper. And when you look at this bird, you might be thinking, but, but Greg, there, there are no spots on that spotted sandpiper. And you are absolutely correct that in its winter plumage, which is what you see here, the bird has no spots. But when it gets, uh, when it reaches the breeding plumage in the spring, um, it, it's, the whole breast is just covered in very bold black spots against the white breast. And what's particularly notable is a field mark about this bird is that his tail is constantly bobbing. And so when they walk, it's almost like they, they just can't control themselves. They're so happy to be there that they just are constantly wagging their tail up and down. And it's not just the tail, it's the whole body. Uh, it really is just going through this full wagging spectrum and they're, they too are fun to watch. Um, and this is also a bird that you can see in migration, even in the Birmingham area along uh, creeks and streams. I, I've seen them actually at Railroad Park, even on the little pond that's there by the pavilion pool. I've seen them on the Cahaba River. Um, and so just at different areas, uh, spring and fall during the migration season. They're fairly late as a migrant in the spring and fairly early as a migrant in the fall. The bird I saw at, at Railroad Park was probably actually in August, late August when I saw it. So, but this is one that you could very easily see. It's a fairly common bird, uh, just like the ruddy turnstone, very, very common in the appropriate habitat. And then one of the other more spectacular, what I would call the seabirds, or getting away from the shore type birds and getting to the seabirds, is this one here called the magnificent frigate bird. And if ever there was a bird that looked like a pterodactyl, I, I do believe it would have to be the, the various species of frigate birds. And it just so happens that the one that we have here in Alabama, primarily in the middle part of the summer, uh, is the magnificent frigate bird. They don't breed in the state, but they do breed uh, over off the coast of Louisiana. And so um, these birds, you know, for them to fly several hundred miles in search of food is not a problem. Uh, they do it routinely. Um, with these tremendous gossamer type wings, they're able to just soar effortlessly on the sea breeze and they will either fetch food for themselves or they will in particular they really do like to pirate hence the name frigate bird they like to pirate the birds or the, the food that other birds catch and so they can be fairly aggressive in that regard and, and they do occasionally show up in inland in alabama following a hurricane so um, if you ever are in a situation where a hurricane has passed to our west, uh, you know, has come ashore, say like in Mississippi or Louisiana, then the counterclockwise winds from those hurricanes bring many different species of birds that are typically found at the coast inland. And so frigate bird is one that certainly is a possibility. As is this next bird, it's a very familiar brown pelican. And they too are found um, at the coast. Uh, they do breed in the state. There's a good breeding population of them on Gayard Island, which is on the west side of Mobile Bay. Uh, but that's a wonderful place to look for them. Just um, such a charismatic uh, bird that is characteristic. When, I think if you were to mention you know, what bird did I see at the coast? A brown pelican would probably be at, near the top of everyone's list. Um, just a spectacular bird. Uh, and, you know, their beak with their pouch, uh, these birds are dive bombers. They dive after the fish and into the water. And when they catch the fish, that 
tremendous pouch just opens and swallows up all the, the whatever fish they're able to catch and then they strain out the water before they uh, swallow the fish. Um, but these birds have about a six foot wingspan. And this is an adult bird here. If it were a juvenile, the head would be more brown, overall brown. And that's true of the juvenile in the body as well. The, the, the brown is much more uniform uh, on the juvenile. But if we look at some of the gulls that we have down there, uh, everybody, when you mention gulls, you probably think, oh, seagulls. Well, the truth of the matter is that many of our gulls are equally at home on freshwater lakes and rivers and impoundments. And so seagull is a bit of a misnomer uh, in that they do occur in lots of places where there are freshwater. But it just so happens that the laughing gull is the one that is most familiar to people that frequent the beach in Alabama just because they are so common they do breed in the state, um, just very common. And when you see them in the summertime, they have this dark hood with the white eye arcs that you can see. But when you see them in winter, this is how they would appear as the adult bird. As you can see, the head is no longer completely black. They still show the eye arcs, um, but it's, you get more of a slightly faded hooded look. To the bird in the winter time. Um, um, Greg? Yes. How often does that happen that they're so drastically different from immature to mature? Um, so I mean, it, it depends on species. It just so happens that with the gulls, um, it, generally the gulls come in what we call a two year gull, a three year gull, and a four year gull. And by that, what I mean is. It either takes two years or three years or four years to reach full adult plumage. And so it just so happens that the laughing gull is one that takes three years to reach its full adult plumage, which is what this is here. And so um, when you see this, you know you're looking at an adult bird, but it is entirely possible that if you were at the coast in the summertime, that you might see laughing gulls that more strongly resemble something like this, where they don't have the full hood. And so it might be that it, depending on when the chick was born, um, it could be a bird that was born that year, or it could be one that is in its second summer, or it takes, it could be the third summer before they get the full adult plumage. Um, Thank you. Thanks. It, yeah. So, but not all birds are like this, but it just so happens that with the gulls, it's their two year, three year and four year gulls. And the other thing that uh, equates with that um, is that the sizes, the, so the two year gulls are the smallest gulls, the three year gulls are intermediate and the four year gulls are truly enormous birds. They have, you know, three foot wingspans, they're huge. So, uh, we'll move on to another gull that you could find down at the coast, and that is the ring-billed gull that you can see here. And he does indeed show this uh, black ring on a yellow bill, and it has yellow legs. So I always tell people with the gulls, the key to identifying them is getting a good focus on their leg color and then also trying to make note of where the black occurs on the bird. And so as you can see in the ring bill, yellow legs with a black ring on a yellow bill. And then the other thing that comes in handy uh, is noting what the presence or absence of these little white feather tips down here. I call them little strobe lights and that's certainly not what they are. <laughs> But that's what they remind me of, our strobe lights. And so ring-billed gulls, again, they're, they're not particularly common at the coast in the summertime. Um, you're more likely to encounter them as in fall, winter, and spring. And certainly in North Alabama, uh, up 
along the Tennessee River and over on the Coosa River, just almost anywhere. This is truly a very widespread gull, but they typically do like to be along the major river system inland, uh, away from the coast. Um, but a very common, very common bird uh, in the wintertime here in Alabama. And then some of the other uh, birds that we typically see at the coast <clears throat> that are not necessarily gulls, but we often think of them as being, quote, seagulls, are the terns. And with the terns, um, they can be just as abundant uh, down at the coast, and the royal tern would certainly fit that category of being an abundant bird at the coast. But with the terns in general, you have a much pointed, much sharper bill than you would ever see uh, on a gull. And so that's one of the distinguishing features of the terns is that they have this very long uh, pointed uh, bill. Sometimes it might be a thinner uh, bill and sometimes it's a little bit thicker. And then they also have long pointed wings, uh, very buoyant um, in flight when you see them flying. But the ring-billed gull would be one that you could see at the coast. And also at the coast is this highly unusual uh, specialized type of uh, turn uh, is a, a bird called a black skimmer. And if you note carefully, you can see that the bill on the black skimmer, the lower mandible is probably a, a quarter, 25% longer than the upper mandible. And so the skimmers have a unique habit. The gulls and the terns are essentially like plunge divers. Um, the terns will dive into the water. The gulls will kind of dip down to the water to, to try and pick up something, but the terns will actually dive in. But what the black skimmer does is that he flies along the surface of the water, uh, just above the surface, and he lowers his lower mandible into the water and he skims the surface, almost like he is cutting the surface of the water. And when he encounters a fish, well, then he snaps his bill closed and that's how they feed. And they are just such comical looking birds, but they're so, so graceful uh, in flight when you see them uh, doing that skimming. So now I wanna turn away from the birds that you would see at the coast to some of the land birds. And so these are still some birds that you could expect to see either at Dauphin Island or Fort Morgan. And in particular, I want to turn your frame of reference to spring migration. And the reason that is, you may know this, but a lot of our migrants that we have in Alabama, there's of the 400 and some odd species, 450 uh, species that occur in the state, probably half of those at least are what we call neotropical migrants. And so these are birds that would fly across the Gulf of Mexico, or they might, so those would be circumgulf, meaning across, excuse me, I take that back, transgulf migrants would fly across, trans meaning across. And then circumgulf migrants would be birds that come up from Mexico and follow the coastline. But a number of our neotropical migrants are the transgulf type migrants. And what that means is that they fly from the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and they fly nonstop across the Gulf of Mexico. It's about a 600 mile distance. And they typically fly at night when the winds are either blowing from the south or, or not at all. They, they will not fly into a headwind uh, from the Yucatan. Uh, but if the weather is good, um, then you can actually kind of watch, see this on radar if you know what you're looking for. But you can see them. They typically leave about six o'clock in the evening and they fly all night. And they, among the first ones to arrive on the Gulf Coast, and it could be anywhere from coastal Texas to the Florida Panhandle, it just depends. 
Uh, but one of the earliest ones to arrive, simply because it's one of the faster flyers, is this eastern kingbird. And as you can see, very distinctly black and white bird, uh, shaped somewhat like a mockingbird. And it has a white tip on its tail. And if you could see this bill from below, if we were looking straight up at the bird, you would see that it has a very wide bill at the base in proportion to its length. And that is true of a lot of birds that catch insects in flight. And so um, even though he doesn't have flycatcher in his name, as some of our flycatchers do, this bird is in the flycatcher family. And if you look very carefully, you can see that this bird has some uh, specialized feathers around the base of the beak. And these feathers are called rictal bristles, R-I-C-T-A-L, rictal bristles. And they use those as sensory uh, feathers so that they, uh, when they feel the insect, uh, they close their beak. It helps them to keep track of where the insect is, but they will catch them in flight. Uh, truly a, a very unique bird. And they're called kingbird because they will defend their territory from just about any other bird, hawks included. So some of the other birds that you might expect to see at Dauphin Island or at Fort Morgan uh, would be this red-eyed vireo. And even though the, the color of the eye looks dark in this photograph, I believe this was a juvenile bird that I photographed last fall uh, at, uh, actually at, at uh, Railroad Park, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, but with the, um, with the vireos, I mentioned last week about how the warblers have what I call a warbler shaped bill, and I'll point that out in just a minute. Um, but the vireos have a little thicker bill, and it has a very distinct hook uh, tip uh, at the end of the bill. And so that's one of the ways you can tell the vireos from the warblers is that the vireos have that very distinct uh, hook tip. Um, but in addition to the red eye that you would typically see uh, in an adult bird, it's got the black line through the eye with this black above the eye. And the other thing about that this bird illustrates very well is the concept of countershading. So if you are underneath the bird looking up, you see this white belly against a bright sky. And if you are, say, a predator looking at a hawk, for instance, a cooper's hawk, flying above the canopy and you're looking down on the bird, you would see a green back against a green leaves. And so that's what we mean by countershading uh, in birds is that there are two different colors above and below the dorsal and the ventral surface are two different colors uh, as an adaptation. And so if you see a bird that's like this, um, that's one clue that you can have that it, <clears throat> that it is a bird that spends time in the canopy. So if we look at this next one, we have a Louisiana water thrush. And when you look at this one, you say, well, I see it has a long slender bill and it, it two tips come together. So there's no, there's no hook on the tip of this one. So this one actually is a type of warbler. Um, and it just so happens that Louisiana water thrush, the name implies that they do indeed spend time near water. And so that would be the case. Uh, when you look at this bird, you might think, oh, it's somewhat reminiscent of a Carolina wren that I showed you last week. It has this the brownish bird overall, uh, and it has that white eye stripe that the wren has. Um, but it doesn't show that rufous color. Uh, of course, and the wren also has a, a clear breast, whereas the water thrushes, uh, there's also another one called a northern water thrush that looks very similar to this one, but they're both found near water. And here we have another uh, species of warbler. There's uh, 30, eight different species of warblers in the eastern United States. So they can be a challenge. Um, Shannon asked earlier about birds that uh, have different plumages, uh, depending on whether it's an adult or an immature. Well, with some of our warblers, not all of them, but with some of them, 
the females and the males look different uh, in the spring and in the fall. And so the bay-breasted warbler is one that I will show you a photograph of a female in a little bit. Uh, but this is what the male looks like in the spring. And he does indeed show this bay breast. But when you look at the head, you'll recall last week I mentioned that if you can get a good look at the head on any bird, um, if you can focus on the bill. So here we have this nice warbler bill. But the facial pattern is just about everything you would ever need to recognize this as being a bay-breasted warbler. So this is just one of many that comes through Dauphin Island in the spring. And then here we have the male summer tanager. So I mentioned earlier about birds besides male cardinals that are all red. Well, this is the one I had in mind the male summer tanager. And with the tanagers, um, they have a much thicker bill. And so this has what I would call a tanager type bill. It's much thicker, fairly stout. And it just so happens that this one was feeding on some mulberries. And so that's why his bill is all gnarly looking like this. Uh, he wasn't particularly tidy. But this is a bird that actually occurs in our area as a breeding bird. If you were to go to Oak Mountain State Park, for instance, um, in the summertime, this is one you could easily hear. It sounds a little bit like a horse robin, or a robin that's had a cough, or not a cough, but a cold. And so that is the male summer tanager, just a spectacular bird. The female, on the other hand, is this overall uh, yellowish green color. So uh, this is one where the male and the female look different. And this bird was also photographed on Dauphin Island. Um, and in particular, this is the water drip. If you've ever been to the shell mounds uh, at Dauphin Island, that's where this particular bird was photographed. And so, and when I mentioned the water drip, the drip is actually, you know, this is something you can emulate in your backyard, as I was mentioning last week. So there is a little bit of a hose that's out of sight, but then drips some water from the tip of the hose down into a shallow depression where there is already some water standing. And so that sound of that dripping water is just a major, major magnet for birds. And certainly the neotropical migrants, when they're first arriving, uh, the Yucatan Express, so to speak, that was Bob Reed's term for it, was the Yucatan Express. And you could always tell when it was due because typically the Eastern kingbirds start arriving around one o'clock. So if you weren't seeing any birds in the morning on Dauphin Island, well, don't give up hope. Uh, just wait for the express to arrive at one o'clock, because if it's going to arrive, that's about the time that the kingbirds start to roll in. So now I want to go ahead and show you some of other areas in the state, and let's take a look at the Black Belt region. And um, so in particular, I'm referring to, let me back up just a minute. This is a, an area that you can actually see I mean, this is a satellite photograph, this Google Maps. And you can actually see this remnant prairie that occurs all along here. It starts just south and west of uh, Columbus. It's fairly narrow through here. But then as you go south of Montgomery and then through Selma and on up through Demopolis, Greensboro is right here. And then it just comes right up through the state. And this is some excellent, excellent birding areas. And so I love going to the Black Belt just because it's places where we can see these spectacular birds called scissor tail flycatchers. Uh, and this is a bird, the males have got very long tails, as you can see here. The female is also has a long tail, but it's not quite as long. Uh, but um, if you can, re well, actually, I'll, I haven't showed you yet, uh, but their tail is, is the forked tail when they fly. It is just a spectacular sight. But this is a bird uh, photograph just south of Greensboro last summer. Uh, if you've been to um, 
Well, it, I was just going to say, when you go to the black belt, you really have to be going there for a reason. And I could spend all my days in the black belt darting pretty much year round. But I really like going in the summer just because that's when the scissor tail fly catchers are there. Um, and, Greg? Yeah. Um, isn't that, that's really a, been a big focus in the last couple of years for Alabama, trying to beef up ecotourism in the Black Belt, and they've developed the uh, Black Belt birding group, and there's there's a specific, you know, group that, that can take you on, you know, tours and stuff. It's really, really become a hot thing. Oh, yes, very much so. Yeah, there is a, 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 a young man, a young black man by the name of Christopher Joe, who with his dad and his brother has started a birding uh, tourism uh, business on their property. They have 200 acres uh, that's between, it's just north of Bonsdale, about six or seven miles, and south of Greensboro, about maybe 12, 13 miles, somewhere in that range. Um, but there are third generation Black Angus cattle farmers, cattle ranchers, and they have 200 acres of property. And these are some of the birds that we go to see. Uh, in fact, they're actually getting ready to have their first spring birding event on March 27th. Uh, so in just about another month's time. Uh, but the scissor tail flycatcher is certainly one of the signature birds of Alabama's Black Belt region. And as I mentioned earlier, the flycatchers have got a thick, wide bill, and certainly this one is no exception to that. Another bird that's a signature bird of the Black Belt, if you want to call it that, is the dick thistle. Um, not nearly as large, maybe not quite as showy, but just truly a study in the subtle colors of the earth tones somewhat reminiscent of a meadowlark in that it shows the yellow on the face, but it has this beautiful chestnut patch uh, in the wing. And it's just a spectacular bird. I don't see them nearly as much as I would like to, um, but that is another bird that is um, found in our black belt. And then one that is certainly widespread throughout the state, not just in the black belt, but uh, one that I acquaint with the black belt is the indigo bunting. And this spectacular male is perched on top of a uh, sunflower uh, here. And if you have not been to the sunflower field that is west of Otagaville, so if you go down to uh, Prattville and go west on Alabama Highway 14, uh, when you reach Otagaville, you've got about another six or seven miles to go and you come to this place called the Sunflower Field and they have a presence on Facebook. It's just, it's called the Sunflower Field. And if you look on Facebook, uh, generally in the latter part of June and into July and then through, through July, they open up their fields, their sunflower fields to um, people that wanted to come and either cut the sunflowers and, and take them home with decoration or just for photograph, it's a wonderful young couple who with their kids uh, operate this place. And needless to say, I, I make it a, a regular you know, pilgrimage, if you want to call it that, uh, down there every summer just to photograph the sunflowers and the birds that come to feed on them. And so the male indigo bunting, the female, surprisingly, is all brown. She shows hardly any blue. Um, and of course, that's because of camouflage. She is the one on the nest. And another signature bird, and this is not nearly as close as I would like for it to be. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still working on my uh, male painted bunting uh, photography, but this is one that was photographed actually just to the east of Otagaville. Uh, but certainly one that occurs there below Greensboro. I haven't yet seen them at the Joe farm, but it's only a matter of time before I do. <laughs> but the male painted bunning with its bright red belly and a, just an indigo blue head and then a chartreuse green back, which unfortunately is uh, concealed by this twig. 
but the female is just as beautiful. Um, this is the photograph by Grace Sims, who may or may not be on tonight, um, but she actually photographed this bird in her backyard here in the Birmingham area. And so, um, so it's not expected to be here, but this is the second time I have heard of somebody having a painted bunting at their feeder. Another one was a friend of mine who had one uh, at her house where she lived in Trustville in the fall. Uh, this was many, many years ago. So a painted bunting, sometimes, you know, birds when they're migrating, they overshoot their target. And so if you see something like this, it is not a bird you are likely to forget. But the green on the male on his back is the same color as what you see here on the back of the female. Just a spectacular bird. And again, it's not particularly common in the black belt, but if you want to see one in Alabama, that's really, if you're not at Dauphin Island in the spring, then you pretty much have to go to the black belt in the summer to see one. And then the Northern Bob White, I, I put this bird in here, this particular slide, just because it highlights that birds that were once common, like the Northern Bob White, can sometimes be in a very steep decline, which is obviously a great conservation concern. And the Bob White certainly falls into that category. Um, if you've ever heard one with that Bob White, Bob White, it's a, a very loud whistle. Um, it is just, it's, you know, the signature bird of open prairies. But unfortunately, as we lose a lot of our open prairies and farming practices, you know, it used to be that the farmers would um, leave hedgerows and they wouldn't go right up to the edge of their property. And so the Bob Whites did just fine in that kind of habitat. But now that um, everything is, you know, we spray pesticide and herbicide on everything and we farm right up to the edge of the property, the Bob Whites really are suffering as a result. And I would also suspect that the fire ants uh, play a role in, in their demise as well. Um, but this is truly a bird that uh, with the Conservation Corps, some of the farm programs that the uh, farmers have um, that are you know, government funded farm programs. Sometimes when they, you know, they might be, uh, even though they might not use the full amount of their property for farming, <clears throat> if they set aside some of their land for conservation or that they can be reimbursed for that. And this is one of those species that certainly benefits from the conservation program. And without a doubt, the most spectacular of all of the birds, at least in my humble opinion, <laughs> uh, as far as the black belt is concerned, are the American swallowtail kites. These are birds that start to show up in coastal Alabama in about another two weeks or so, they start to arrive in mid-March and they breed in the Mobile Tensaw Delta, maybe even a little bit further, further north from there. But as we get into summer, when the young fledge and leave the nest, well, then they follow the adults and they kind of migrate together. And so they undergo what we call a post-breeding dispersal and they move north in the state. And essentially what they are doing is that they are looking for places where they can feed over uh, pasture land like this, especially where it's, it's like grass. And in particular, what they're trying to do, as we can see in this photograph here, is they're catching insects and they catch them with their feet. So imagine this is a bird that's it only weighs about a pound and a half and it has a four foot wingspan. Let me back up just to give you, and this is a juvenile bird here that the adults have got even longer outer tail feathers, maybe out to about here, just a spectacular bird. And in fact, the child's toy, the kite, is named for the bird, if that kind of gives you any indication of their acrobatic ability. 
but they are feeding over these open fields and they especially like when the farmers are cutting hay because that stirs up the insects into flight and then they can catch those insects on the wing. And then here you can see this bird has actually caught what looks to be either a grasshopper or perhaps a katydid. And then the other kite that we get is the Mississippi kite. And my friend Harriet, she always called these flying broomsticks. And that is because they quite often fly with their tail spread like this. Uh, and it does look like a bit like an old fashioned whisk type uh, broomstick. And here we have one with a slightly different angle and you can see this nice uh, rusty red color in the wing, but this is the adult bird with that blood red eye. And then another bird that is quite uh, charismatic in its own right is the wood stork. Uh, this is a bird that does not breed in Alabama. They breed in Florida and coastal Georgia and a little bit in the coastal South Carolina. But they too undergo a post breeding dispersal and they come west from their breeding ground. And quite often um, they are a fairly common sight below Greensboro um, where the catfish ponds are. Just if ever there was a typical summer day for me, it can be hot as blazes and billowing clouds against the sky. But when you see these wood storks in flight, just the striking black and white wing pattern. Uh, it's just tro truly spectacular to see. The juveniles, I don't know if you can see it well in this photograph, but they have got a yellowish bill, whereas the adults, as seen here, have a flint, uh, flint gray color. It looks a little bit like a scaly. And as is true of the vultures with their bare heads, the wood storks also have bare heads and they are primarily carrion. They like to eat dead things, primarily fish. And another bird that uh, can be sometimes seen in the Black Belt, and even in Alabama, in as far north as Birmingham, is the roseate spoonbill. Both the wood stork and the spoonbills have been seen just south of Birmingham, actually in Birmingham, I guess, technically. Um, but Limestone Park down near Alabaster uh, is one place where roseate spoonbills have appeared in recent years along with the wood storks. And another one that we see down there is the American white pelican. And I've got another photograph later to, to show you, but this is a bird that typically should not be here in the summertime, but they are found in the black belt because these are birds that are, they know they're not going to breed, so they don't even bother migrating. They show up in winter, they stay through the summer, and it's like, eh, I don't feel like traveling, I'm just going to stay put, so they do. And then here we have a ruddy duck, and this is just south, this is just about a mile or two from the Joe farm. Cute little duck, stiff-tailed duck. Uh, the males have got this kind of like an old-fashioned leather helmet, uh, football helmet with the blue bill. And the females just have the helmeted look. And in the, in the wintertime, this was in the summer, but in the wintertime, the males look much more like the female. So let's move on. And now we're gonna look at some of the areas around Birmingham. So here we have an anhinga. Uh, also sometimes called the water turkey because they have a long tail that they can fan out like a turkey. Uh, but this is a bird, I didn't photograph this one at, at Limestone Park, but they do occur there as a breeding bird in the swamp that is immediately west of Limestone Park, which is on Highway 31 in Alabaster. If you get off at exit number 238, it goes south about three or four miles you'll see the Saginaw pipe plant with that enormous bright yellow, retina burn yellow uh, buildings. And just to the south of that Saginaw plant is where Limestone Park is located. Great, great, great year round birding destination. But in the spring and summer is when you can typically expect to see the males and the female in Hingas. The females look pretty much uh, identical to this, except they have a tan colored neck. 
compared to the male's dark red or dark uh, black color. Killdeer, very common bird uh, there. They occur there as a breeding bird. You can see killdeer pretty much statewide. They, they really do like the open grassy areas. Um, you'll see them in pastures, uh, golf courses even. Uh, but with this uh, double breast band, uh, very common. This is the bird that does the fake broken wing imitation to lure you away. But killdeer is a bird that you can expect to see there at Limestone Park. A great egret, uh, another uh, bird that you can see there at Limestone Park, uh, actually found statewide, fairly common, just about anywhere you have uh, fairly large bodies of water. And as I mentioned, I think last week, when you're looking at the various egret species, you wanna focus on the leg color and the bill color. So the combination of- Hey, oh my gosh with the black legs is a good field mark for the great egret. Here we have a purple martin. Um, they are arriving now, actually. Uh, so if you've got martin houses near you, you should keep an eye out for them. Uh, they love to eat the insects. So encouraging purple martins is a great idea. And also to be found there at Limestone Park are tree swallows, just this magic electric blue green the females are somewhat greener on the mat, on their back and the males are this bluish color but limestone park is just about as far south as you could typically expect to see them as a breeding bird they're a little bit further south in some areas in the state but they do occur there as a breeding species uh, especially along the if you live along the coosa river basin uh, this is a bird that you could expect to see as well. If we just slip on over to Ebenezer Swamp, just a little bit to the west of Limestone Park, uh, just north of Montevallo, that's where you could expect to see the prothonotary warbler. Former name was the Golden Swamp Warbler, which is appropriately named. Just a very loud ringing, sweet, 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 sweet call. Uh, but that is a, you know, a signature bird for that park, in my opinion. And they start to show up in about another month or so. So we're, we're still a little bit off from seeing the prothonotary, but they are there, easy access on the boardwalk. Um, so this is the bird you could readily expect to find at Ebenezer Swamp. As is the northern parula. Now the parulas are a little more of a challenge because they are more often found in the canopy as you can see, there's counter shading going on there with the light belly and the darker back. But it's got that warbler bill, so you know it's one of the warblers. Also, the various hawk species that we have in the state are well represented in the Birmingham area. Here we have a red-shouldered hawk. You can even see the red in the shoulder. This is an adult bird. And then if you look at the red-tailed hawk, this is a juvenile, but it shows the belly band, which is a great field mark for red-tailed hawks. Both of these are birds that are like sit and wait predators. Um, they sit there and they wait for something to appear and then they fly down and catch it. It could be a bird or it could be a mammal or pretty much anything. And then the last one I wanted to show you that was really kind of a, an oddity and I, I put this in here for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, it, it, this is a limpkin, I'll start with that. And so just a really spectacular bird. You see that long bill and the long leg, you would think, well, it's probably a wading bird. And that is indeed the case. Um, but these are birds that are typically found in Florida. And there is one lake that is an extreme South Alabama where they most likely do occur as a breeding bird. But two years ago, um, and this just kind of proves the point that birds don't read very well. They have wings, but they can't follow directions. They don't know what it means to look at a map. And so two years ago in 2019, at one time we had three of these in the Birmingham area. And it just so happened that this was one uh, at a Chelsea Park, that subdivision right off of Highway 280. 
that's why I photographed this bird. But Shannon's husband, Randy Haddock, who at the time worked for the Cuyahoga River Society, now retired from there. But he had one at the exact same time on the Cahaba River here in Birmingham. And then another friend who was active in the birding, uh, in the birding community in Birmingham, uh, Tony Baker, had one uh, that was seen multiple times. All three of these birds were seen multiple times um, uh, at Ebenezer Swamp. And so we had three limpkins in the Birmingham area all at the same time two years ago. And that is almost unheard of. So it's when you see something like this, it's not that it can't happen. It's just that you, it's not what you would typically expect to see. But a limpkin is something you really can't confuse with anything else just because it is so unique. And down in Florida, they are known for eating apple snails. But up here, since we don't have apple snails, uh, they adapted quite readily to feeding on mollusks. So I want to show you, I mentioned earlier about the male bay-breasted warbler uh, with his nice dark brown, you know, the nice bay breast. Well, here we have a female in the fall. And so warbler bill, nice bold white uh, wing bars here. Just an ever so slight hint of, of the bay coloring on the flanks and streaking on the back. But this is a bird I photographed at Railroad Park. Um, it was gleaning insects from underneath the leaves uh, of the trees there. And I think I may have showed you this photograph last weekend, but here we have a uh, yellow rumped warbler, also formerly known as a myrtle warbler, feeding on wax myrtle berries. So both of these are birds that you can have in your yard easily as migrants. And here's another photograph of Railroad Park. As you can tell, I spend a lot of time there. Uh, but I put this photograph in here to illustrate the, uh, these are northern ruffling swallows that are flying over the pond, uh, the little reflecting pool there at, uh, at the park. But it just emphasizes the fact that even the park, which is 19 acres of formerly you know, abandoned warehouses and just, you know, cityscape is now an oasis for birds and other wildlife. Yellow crowned night heron is another bird found there at the park in the summertime. Here we have, if you go there at night, um, the night herons, of course, are well named. They love to feed on the crayfish. And so I photographed this bird last year stalking the crayfish at night. Uh, there at the park. Great blue heron feeding on the goldfish. Now this is an immature bird. He doesn't look like your typical adult would. The adult would show much more white up here and then black plumes coming off the back. But here you can see he is feeding on goldfish there at the park. Song sparrows, this is another bird that is fairly abundant in winter, but in the spring and summer, most of them moved north, but Birmingham is right at the southern edge of their breeding range. So this is one bird you could expect to see at a railroad park, even in the summertime. Got that typical sparrow-shaped bill and that it's adapted, well adapted to eating seeds. Another seed eater that I photographed there at the park is the American goldfinch. This is the male in the breeding colors. Notice he is feeding on purple. This is actually not, not purple coneflower. This is the giant coneflower um, that grows there at the park. And chimney swifts, I mentioned them earlier. So in the summertime, they start showing up around April 1st in the Birmingham area. And then later on in the summer, as they undergo their, when they start to move south in migration, which can be as early as mid-July, uh, they start to gather in huge numbers if they go to roof together in the evening. And this is truly a spectacle. If you've not ever seen it, uh, you should uh, monitor the Alabama Audubon website for special trips that we have just to look at the chimney swifts. We call that a swift NATO. It's a term that Michelle Reynolds 
uh, coined a couple of years ago, which I thought was ever so appropriate. And then I want to close out tonight just looking at some of the birds that you could expect to see in North Alabama. So if we go to Gunnersville, certainly uh, Gunnersville State Park with their Eagle Awareness programs uh, had brought great attention to bald eagles in Alabama. Uh, however, they are now found statewide, no longer just in North Alabama. Several years ago now, uh, Keith Hudson with the Alabama non-game uh, program in the Department of Conservation, the State Department of Conservation, headed up the Eagle Hacking Program. And their goal was to establish 100 breeding pairs of bald eagles in the state. Well, we are now well past that, probably well past 200, on our way to 300 nesting pairs of bald eagles in the state. Um, so almost any large river or large body of water will now have, could potentially host bald eagles. They love to catch fish. And also, as you can see here, this one is feeding on a ruddy duck with that nice spatula, uh, spatula shaped bill. But they love waterfowl and, and they will, they actually, they would actually prefer to steal their food <laughs> from other, from other <laughs> birds if they can. Uh, but yeah. they're well suited to catching ducks. That uh, common loon is another bird that's uh, well represented in Gunnersville as is the uh, horned grebe. Looks a little bit like a miniature version of a loon uh, in the same group. Uh, both the grebes and the loons have got their feet set so far back on their body that they can't walk on land, but they're quite adept at flying, excuse me, at swimming in the water because their feet are so far back. They use them like rudders. And other birds that you could expect to see in North Alabama near the water, and especially in the wintertime, the, the bald eagles are there year round, but the loons and the grebes and the white pelican are primarily winter only birds. They show up in the fall and they leave in the spring. Um, but the American white pelican, um, I mentioned earlier that the brown pelican, I think mentioned, it, has a six foot wingspan these birds have got a nine foot wingspan. It is enormous, just absolutely enormous. Very diagnostic with this yellow pouch, uh, just a spectacular bird. It has the same black and white wing pattern that we saw on the wood stork and on the um, swallowtail kite. The difference being that their black doesn't extend all the way to the body. It's just on the outer portion of the wing. And then I wanted to close out just a few more slides and then we'll take questions. Uh, snow geese. So if we leave the Gunnersville area and head over to Decatur to Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge, uh, this time of the year, if you go to Limestone Bay, Arrowhead Landing, uh, you can look that up on the Alabama Coastal Birding Trails website, or you can just go to the uh, Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge website. This is a publicly accessible area and every winter there are about 2,000 snow geese that come to this particular spot. They are just as reliable as clockwork. So um, truly a spectacle to behold. Certainly Wheeler attracts many other species of ducks including uh, redheads, although I must admit these birds were photographed here in Birmingham at Patton Park. They were a one day wonder. <laughs> they were there one day and gone the next. But what most people know Wheeler for are the cranes. And so thousands and thousands and thousands, and I do mean thousands, of sandhill cranes descend on Wheeler every year. And if you have not been there to see this, you owe it to it to yourself. You must promise me that you will go. They are still there. They'll be there for probably another three or four weeks at least, although their numbers do, will start to thin out a little bit before too much longer. But thousands of sandhill cranes, if you get a close up look at them, uh, you can see that they've got this red uh, forehead with this long bill. They probe in the, in the grass or in the mud, in this case, maybe they're looking for grain or insects. Uh, they're pretty much omnivores, 
but just a spectacular sight to behold. And then I'll close that with this last shot of whooping cranes. Uh, there are, it's an endangered species. Uh, there's been as many, I think a couple of years ago, I can recall reading that there was as many as 26 or 27 whooping cranes during the span of that winter that were at Wheeler Wildlife Refuge, which is easily one quarter of the Eastern migratory flock. This is probably one of the rarest birds in North America. So earlier, Shannon had asked me, what's one of the rarest birds I've ever seen? Um, I would have to actually include the whooping crane in that list. So if you wanna go, now is the time to go see them. So with that, I will close out of my screen sharing so that I can see the questions. And so, um, so let's see. So I'll just. I tried to, uh, I tried to um, act, you know, put in the chat the names of most of those places you were mentioning uh, in case people are multitasking. But the best place, like you, you said, is the Alabama birding trails. You know, just about anywhere you plan to go. Like we, when we head to Tennessee, we're going to stop at, you know, Wheeler or Gunnersville or both. If we're heading down to the beach, we're going to be in the Black Belt region. We're going to look on the beach, you know, just about anywhere you go. And all those places are, um, illustrated on the, the Alabama birding trails. Um, but I did have a specific question. They're going down with kids to Dolphin Island. Is there a particular spot for them to take the kids for birding? Okay, so it says here, you'll be at the Sea Lab on March 12th through the 14th. So time-wise, you are gonna be right on the cusp of when the neotropical migrants start to arrive. And so, Places that I can recommend would either be the Shell Mounds, it's just Shell Mound Park, uh, and it, everything there on Dauphin Island is relative, excuse me, it's relative to the giant water tower. So when you come in on Highway 193, that road, has, there's a T intersection uh, at Bienville Boulevard, and there's a giant water tower in front of you. So if you turn left and go about two blocks, to Iberville and turn left on Iberville, that will take you and go one block, that will take you to where the Shell Mounds Park is. And then right at the intersection with the Shell Mound Park, that is Cadillac Avenue. And so if you go east, continue going east on Cadillac, uh, that will take you to the uh, Dauphin Island uh, bird sanctuary has their own property that's called um, the goat tree or goat tree uh, reserve and so that's another good place so if it were me I would either go to uh, first I would go to Shell Mound Park and then if not there um, go to the goat trees and then also you can go to just one block on Bienville Boulevard the goat trees is at uh, Cadillac and Grant Street. And if you just go half a block south back to Bienville Boulevard, uh, that is where Cadillac Square Park is located. So that's another great birding destination. Um, and there are yeah. public restrooms there, but that's an important thing to know that if you're looking for restrooms, that's the place to go. And then certainly <laughs> the, the main, the Audubon Sanctuary is that is maintained by the Dauphin Island Park and Beach Board. And so uh, that is another place to go birding, but and there's some areas within the, the Audubon Sanctuary, primarily what they call the bird banding area, not too far from where the campground is. Um, that is a good spot to go looking there just because of the micro habitat uh, within that area. So those are four I can definitely recommend. And then uh, got, going out, if your kids like the beach itself, going out, if you go to the where the pier, the old pier is located, I mean, the pier is still there. It's just now high and dry. But there's uh, really good shorebirds out uh, from the pier. And that's, that's called Pelican Point. It used to be Pelican Island, but it's now 
reattached to Dolphin Island. And so now it's more like Pelican Peninsula. Um, we had a question specific to Ebenezer Swamp. Is it open to the public? A uh, friend went last week and the, there was a locked gate. I would just, if I were to guesstimate, it, it would be uh, a function of, of how much, pe how many people they have working there. But um, do you know anything about the schedule for Ebenezer Swamp Park? Um, I was not aware that they had a, a, a yeah. gate that they could lock there. Um, but uh, gosh, I, I can honestly say I've not ever heard of that being off limits. Uh, yeah, I'm, it is right off the campus, and it looks like I, I've never been there where there's a locked gate. Yeah. yeah. But now I know that Limestone Park will have sometimes there might be a lock on the gate that's there, and that is, oh. <clears throat> that is Alabaster City Park. Yeah, and yeah. So what you might have to do is go to the Alabaster, the City of Alabaster website to their parks and recreation page uh, on their and, website and see if it has hours listed. And uh, Grace mentions it's not open 24 hours, that much I do know. And I think Ebenezer is also more of a sunrise to sunset. Right. And I think it, Grace mentioned that uh, you know, was it the gate by the parking lot versus sometimes you can just park on the road, you know, and, and go into the parks. But um, let's see, we had another specific question about uh, what's the deal with the albino cardinal in Birmingham and how much does individual variation impact a bird's markings? Yeah, so it's funny that somebody would pose this question because last week, I think it was actually on Sunday. So right before our first session, um, I had two photographs that people had sent to me of albino birds. Uh, yeah. One of them I think was, may have been a towhee. And the only reason I think that is because um, the, the person said that the, the, the bird in the photograph was quite often uh, in the company of a male uh, eastern towhee, a uh, typically plumaged eastern towhee. But certainly, I think maybe just because of the pandemic and the fact that so many people are now spending time at home and they're turning to bird watching at home as a hobby to help pass the time, I yes. think we're seeing a lot more instances of people where you know, this is truly citizen science in action. Um, a couple years ago, um, certainly there was that male yellow cardinal that appeared in Alabaster that achieved, uh, you know, a, almost a cult-like following. <laughs> I don't know that that bird is still alive. I, at least I haven't heard any reports recently. Um, but, you know, coloration in birds, there's, there's always a typical color that birds have but then you know sometimes color in birds can be uh, influenced by their genetics in the case of that roseate spoonbill um i actually heard a presentation just the other day uh, a zoom meeting where the the speaker who studies spoonbills in florida bay in everglades national park said that um you know you may see very faint uh pink in some flamingos, not flamingos, but in the spoonbill, but they always show at least some level of pink. But yeah. in the case of the American flamingo, they get their pink from their diet. And so uh, it just depending on what the species is, you may know that red, the, the carotenoids, the red pigments in birds is what gives them their red color, or they're able to synthesize it from the carotenoids. Um, so that but, uh, is, blue Greg, I want bird to is actually a structural pigment. There is no blue mm -hmm. pigment. It's actually a structural color based on the structure of the feathers. So, I was going to bring up that birding is the one hobby that you can do in almost any situation. You know, you can join a hiking group and bird while you're hiking. You can you can go. Uh, with the Cahaba River Society on a canoe trip and get some really great 
birding done. Um, you know, if you head to the beach, you could do birding there. And, um, you know, people are even birding in the sense of uh, the uh, bird cams that they have all over the world, watching nest and watching bird. Um, it doesn't have to be something that you have to go and hike for. Um, you know, attracting them to your yard is something that you can do while in, in, in quarantine. So birding is, is just a very versatile, um, what do you want to say, hobby, you know? Uh, and you can get as involved or as little involved as you want, you know? Right. That's why I like it. I always yeah. tell people, take your binoculars, even if you don't think you're going to go birding, take your binoculars anyway, because you never know what you're going to see. You just, you mm -hmm. know, several years ago, I went with the choir from our church, Our Lady of Sorrows, and I went to Rome, and I took my binoculars with me just because I wanted to see the birds. And of course, when we got into the Sistine Chapel, everybody was like, man, you are a genius for bringing your binoculars into the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> I was like... Well, I wish I could lay claim to thinking of that in advance, but I didn't. I took it for the birds, but it came in handy to look at Michelangelo's masterpiece. Well, I thank you so much, Greg, for opening my my eyes to more than I normally know. And uh, I have I have enjoyed your two talks. I will say to everybody listening that this will also get recorded and posted on YouTube and Facebook for the Hoover Library. And um, like I said, if you want more classes by Greg or more birding classes, check the Alabama Audub Audubon site. There's also a, a Facebook group, Birding Alabama, that you can kind of follow where people are going, where people are seeing things, uh, unique pictures around. So that's a great, great, group either group, group. there's another one called the alabama i mentioned the alabama birding trails the website mm -hmm. com, but the alabama birding trails also sponsors a facebook page that i help to moderate so i don't i don't help with the birding alabama one but i do help with the uh, alabama birding trails facebook page so that's another it, we always get lots of questions and you know just mm -hmm. post a picture and it, it just ask i mean that's how we all learn it's, you know, we see yeah. something intrigued, intrigued us and we want to know something. So post a picture and say, hey, can somebody help me? You know, I've been looking through my field guide and I think it might be this or I think it might be that, but I'm not 100% sure. And so everybody chimes in. It's a great, great resource. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Greg. You bet. And you have a great evening. All right, y'all. Bye. Bye.